So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's Love Languages session. I am excited to delve into what's your love language and how do you utilize that at home or in the workplace and just in life in general. And today we have the most wonderful facilitator. I am a huge fan because this is now part two for us of our Love Languages session, one last year and one again this year. And without further ado, I just wanna hand it over to James Brunson. James, it's all yours. Sandrine, every time I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get Sandrine on my team <laughs> with the introduction. I mean, it's just, you set it up every time. It's like, I can't help but succeed with an introduction like that. Um, but hello, everybody. Uh, I'm James Brunson. It is an absolute gift to uh, be amongst the people today. Um, I, I find that there's a lot of gratitude where people can come together to um, learn something new or even just revisit something that feels familiar, but maybe try to look at it from a different perspective. Um, and also everybody on here has different ideas, different backgrounds, different understandings of the world. Um, and so as an extrovert, the, the more people in the space, the more I tend to kind of come alive. So I feel your energy, um, but I, I, I welcome you to uh, show up um, as you feel safe enough, confident enough, ask the questions, allow yourself to be curious um, about some of these ideas and concepts. Um, love languages is something that uh, I would say has, has infiltrated much of our kind of modern day world, but it always, I, kind of what I was saying earlier about like something can feel familiar, but there's always an opportunity to kind of see it from a fresher perspective if you allow yourself to be curious. Uh, so this is your space. I am just a visitor. I'm just here uh, along the journey of life with you. Um, and so I invite yourself to get comfortable, uh, pay attention, be as available as you can. I understand it's three o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, so you people have had some days uh, thus far. So let's move on. So I'm going to share my screen and let me know if it works properly because we know how these things can go. Y'all can see that, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yep. And and Nancy will tell you, I don't know, there's some familiar faces on here. Some like I, I am a son of a Baptist uh minister, and so I love a good amen corner. So if you could see something or if you have an issue, feel free to say it out loud or put it in the chat and I will attend to it. So we could. All right, let's move on. So Today, we're going to be talking about the utilization of the five love languages. Um, I think it's important for people to have a little bit of conceptual understanding um, about what it is and um, how it's applied. Um, majority of the, the slide is kind of set up to talking uh, uh, directly with um, in a more professional setting. Um, but I will sprinkle in some adaptations about how you can apply them in your, your personal, romantic, or familial relationships. Um, and near the end, we'll do some, um, we'll do an interactive kind of quiz that way you can see yours. Um, hopefully the link works and we get that kind of set up there, but I think it does. Um, and I, I'll, I really like the breakdown that it kind of offers when we see that. So we'll carve out some time for that, but we'll move on. Here's what we'll cover. We'll identify the five languages. We'll identify your primary love languages. We'll do some self inventory at the end, which I think is valuable. Um, how to recognize uh, your colleagues or your friends or your family members or your romantic partners, how to recognize their love language and um, how to express appreciation for how they receive it, how to apply it. And then my hope is whether it be a newfound understanding or a refreshed understanding of what love languages are, because what I ideologically believe is that I think love, the concept of love and the experience of love always deserves a special attention that we look at it from a fresh pair of eyes. Uh, it's something that lives. It's not just a monument there. It's something that we put into action. And so that's what we'll do. We'll try to do with this presentation today. All right. So let's, this is me. I already said enough about me. I won't waste enough of your time. I'm from the Carolinas. I am in private practice. Um, I love my job. I love people. Uh, I love being alive and interacting with people. And so that's enough about me. And hopefully my cats will not scream at the door during this presentation. 
So we'll see. They're looking at me right now, but they're behaving. A brief moment of pause, if you will. I put this slide in all of my presentations, not only for you all, but also for me as your presenter. Um, it reminds me of my humanity, and so I welcome this pause to remind you of yours. And so I'm going to take a deep breath to settle in for the presentation, and I invite you to do the same. And if you need more, keep breathing. But the one is good for me. All right. So the nerd in me, what is love? What is it? And I love this image of uh, the heart where it has love in many different languages. And while there's a diversity into how love can be spelled out, there's also a diversity into how it can be experienced. And so here are a few quotes from Gary Chapman, who is the author of The Five Love Languages, which we'll, you'll see in the next slide. But here's some of my faves. Love is something that you do for someone else, not something that you do for yourself. Love doesn't erase the past, but it does make the future different. For love, we climb mountains, cross seas, traverse desert sands, and endure untold hardships. Without love, mountains become unclimbable. Seas uncrossable, deserts unbearable, and the hardships are a lot in life. I just really love that last one. The first one, I always, I always have a little bit of, because eh, I think you should love yourself too, but I get what, if you read the book, it, it kind of explains it a little bit more, um, but I love that last quote, um, without love, life, just hardship. So Gary Chapman wrote the book in originally in 1992, but there's been several um, refreshes over the years. Um, but he spent notes from he took notes from counseling uh, couples that he was working with and under pastoral counseling, and he started recognizing patterns in the way in which people were communicating. Um, and he realized that the people that he was working with, he could see the feud between their needs, meaning when human beings come into relationship with one another, there is there is an undertone that's often not said, which is um, to quote my favorite supervisor, told me this maybe 14, 15 years ago, um, relationships are comprised of two selfish people attempting to get needs met. And I remember when he shared that, I thought, selfish, that sounds like a bad thing. Um, but he, it was a bit of a paradoxical thing where it's like human beings at our core, we're all making decisions or behaving in ways and attempts to self-preserve in order for us to stay alive. Like how everybody on the screen, we all need food, water, shelter, warmth. And so when we're in relationships, those needs come up again the need for touch, the need for love, the need for safety and security. And so what happens in many of our relationships, it becomes a fight over whose needs actually supersedes the others and how do we actually attend to one another without that dynamic. And so with this, his kind of gleaning of the five love languages, it was an attempt to help people to not only understand each other better, but to understand themselves better which then makes the connection safer, more loving, more sustainable, okay? So we'll go through them a little bit. Uh, most people have heard, um, I really don't like that phrase when people say most people because that's, that's subjective, but it can be commonly known what the five love languages are, but we'll, we'll go through them um, so you may have a fresh understanding. Uh, so words of affirmation, here's this quote, all of us have these areas in which we feel insecure. We lack courage and that lack of courage often hinders us from accomplishing the positive things that we like to do. That latent potential within your spouse or his or her areas of insecurity may await your encouraging words. And what I love about that quote and the, the importance of words of affirmation it's because the words can oftentimes be a catalyst to someone's healing or to someone's confidence or to someone's safety or trying something new. Um, here's some examples about how it may show up in the workplace. And so it's sharing with someone that they're doing a great job. 
or receiving verbal acknowledgement from your boss or, or telling your boss about the great leadership or curating a, a, an environment where people can share um, the highs and the successes that we're experiencing on the job, or even in the relationship context, it's telling your partner um, or your family member how much you care about them, or even down like, wow, that outfit you have on really suits you, or that color really brings out your eyes, or even as I, I went to go get water and I heard uh, Nancy and someone else talking about um, the setup in my room, and I thought, oh, oh, they saw my flower, they saw my hope sign, and that hope sign was a gift from somebody that I love, and my husband put those flowers there, so I heard those words, and it, and I felt the energy, even though I wasn't in front of you all, right, and so the sharing of, uh, of language, of communicating these words can really have um, a lot of impact on one another, and to give a little bit of, of um, uh, neurological background on this because I think it's just fun to like bear with me as I nerd out a little bit here um when we come when we first leave the womb right when we are born into this world we're already used to perceiving sound while we're in the womb but the minute we get thrusted into oxygen for the first time in our lives we are desperately needing to be attended to this will also come up about physical touch as well but if you think about it many of us we had some sort of caregiver giving us instruction about what to do. So we come into this world really understanding the power or the importance of language. Even if we don't understand what they're saying, we know that we're being spoken to. I don't know the last time you, you like interacted with a baby, but they have no idea or they're not comprehending what you're saying, but they know when you're communicating with them. They laugh, they cry, they, do, they, they, they react to the energy that comes from language, both verbally and non-verbally, all right? I'm gonna check the chat real quick to see. Yeah, thank you for that, Sandrine. If anybody needs, um, take some notes or ask questions, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask the question in the moment. Quality time, this one. All right, so this is when you can offer someone your undivided attention, right? Um, I'll explain same time versus together in a minute, but. Here's some examples. So it's going to lunch with somebody after a project or creating a space where you're giving somebody your undivided attention within reason, of course, because like we're human beings, right? But it's doing a puzzle together, putting your phone down while the other person is speaking. That over the time that I've been a therapist has been a major one because our phones provide so much connection and access to us. So we can sometimes miss what's going on around us to draw attention to same time versus together. Earlier when I said that oftentimes relationships, whether it be romantic, whether it be professional, whether it be familial, it's all about getting needs met. And so for people who have the, who ha are, would rank higher or have um, quality time as their primary love language, there's a distinct difference between doing something together with someone and doing something just at the same time. You probably have moments where you've just kind of been on autopilot, you're kind of getting through the day and like you're in the same room with people, those of us who are like working in the office or interacting with people in the home, like y'all are taking up space at the same time, but whether you're actually in tune together, there's a distinct difference, meaning how much inquiry the person is having on the other person's experience in that quality time, right? When we're interacting with one another, are we actually sharing what we're experiencing on the inside? So the physical body can be there, right? The, that, that's pretty simple, but whether we're actually allowing our hearts or our minds or our souls to exist outside of our bodies, I mean, the sharing of what we're experiencing, that's what gives it its quality. So it's not just about spending time at like at the same time. It's about are you actually inviting the other person to understand your world in that quality time? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? That one can sometimes breed some confusion. Does that distinction make sense what I'm drawing there? Yeah, totally. You know, I, I always hear people saying, oh, we spend time together. We watch TV at night. And it's like uh -huh. very passive, uh -huh. you know, yeah. it's like, yeah. Oh 
Yeah, it, it has value, but oftentimes it can lead people feeling a little bit empty with that quality time, mm -hmm. right? Because you're, 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 there's, there's a, a TV or a concert or a movie or something that is the actual focal point. It's not exactly each other. Right, yeah. That's, that's the difference. Like even right now, like we are spending time together, but the focal point is the presentation. The focal point isn't on, like, I would love to sit here and learn more about you all individually and personally. And we were having a little bit of that at the beginning when we were talking about trips and things that were going on in people's lives. That felt, that to me is what I would consider quality time. Like, do you have, a, is there going to be a pool there? And how much space? Like, we were so invested in it, That's right? right. We're That's talking about, yeah, we're talking about the person's experience, right? And so that is what gives it, it its quality the the direction of the attention all right move it on acts of service um this is the engaging or completing of tasks assignments projects chores um that the other person needs or they may want um so this in the workplace may look like a just checking in email to see if you know if you know somebody who's struggling or you've noticed that they've been out of work very often or this may be your partner if you're noticing that they're kind of struggling cleaning up something or they can't reach the top shelf of something that you may go and you may do that for them or um, doing the dishes, making of the bed, doing laundry, uh, some of those household items. Um, I always think it's important that when we talk about acts of service, that we do a re-examination of roles and stereotypes, um, particularly in our modern day society where we, where we have viewed women as the subservient or the submissive gender. Um, that has definitely turned its head um, over the past 20, 30 years now, but there can sometimes be an expectation that the acts of service comes from a particular role or a particular gender or a particular kind of dynamic within a relationship structure that, or even in the workplace, that that the boss in some way can't do an act of service because there is an employee. And so I try to demystify that, that it acts of service isn't about positioning, it's about care. And everybody is deserving of care, regardless of status, positioning, ethnicity, gender. Um, but again, it goes like if you're in an intimate relationship with someone or a family member, which we'll talk about later on, it comes down to like how that person wants to be loved. Um, and so I'll say more about that when we get into the self inventory. Tangible gifts. So if this is if this is someone's primary love language, like the gifts are tangible, they're visible symbols um, that we are loved, thought of, considered. Um, they can be purchased, they can be found, they can be made. Um, some people argue that this one is the easiest to learn because of the tangibility of the gifts. Words are not necessarily as tangible. Um, acts of service, like it's tangible in the fact that you're performing a task, but when a human being is given something, oh, my, my plants, my hope sign, like when you're given something that you can hold, it's kind of hard to deny its existence. Like it's like, it's in your hand. It, you have a hard time not seeing the other person's care or not having that need met like when you can hold it. So I think that's what makes it easier is that the brain can't compete with how real it is. And so example of this can be like, you know, giving actual gifts for work anniversaries or in your personal life, giving gifts for, you know, milestones in your relationship or um <laughs> I, I laugh because in 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 my marriage we literally celebrate everything like it's like the first date the first time we moved in together the first time we got when we got engaged when we got married and so I'm looking at my yearly budget being like oh wow like we got, got a lot of anniversaries to celebrate here but it 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 all depends on, again, the relationship structure and what actually is meaningful, right? And gifts do not have to be monetary. They can be your time. It can, um, earlier in the last slide when we were talking about um, quality time, like that can also be your gifts. But for people, people with this particular primary love language, it's oftentimes more tangible. 
Um, and I put food here because that, that's, that's, a, that's a special one to my heart there is to receive the gift of food. Physical touch, argued to be the most powerful, but the most challenging and the most challenging, excuse me. Of the five senses, touching is unlike the other four because of how it, it's like localized on an area of the body. Um, and so this, in the, in the professional workplace, it could be like a fist bump or a high five or even making physical eye, eye contact with someone can kind of do the same. Physical touch, it can be tricky within the workplace because there's a special boundary and sensitivity around um, how we interact with people's bodies and how like consent is not um, um, automatic. Um, or it's not um, implied, but it should be something that's a little bit more conscious. And so in like your, even in your romantic and your familial relationships, consent should still, in my opinion, should not be applied, but it should be something that's discussed, um, whether it be hugs, kisses, hand holding. Um, earlier, when we were talking about words of affirmation, and I shared about the neurological process that goes into words of affirmation, physical touch, when we come out of the womb, we if they if we are not held cared for cleaned between the time we leave the womb and the time where we like really start taking in oxygen which is when we're crying and stuff like that our brains can literally decompensate to where we feel unsafe babies can consider what's what's called failure to thrive if we are not held and nurtured within a certain amount of time post leaving the womb postpartum and so neurologically, touch is so important. It, touch literally sends a message at, at our first experience in the world. It sends a message that we're safe. Um, I am currently working with a few couples now. We're talking about the importance of the power of touch. And a lot of times when people hear physical touch, particularly in romantic relationships, we think, sexual intimacy when we think sex or intercourse of some sort and i've been over the past several months i've been trying to demystify that human beings don't need sex we need touch and so in and if this is your primary love language there are so many avenues to receive touch and i think the more people can widen that perspective of how we can receive touch i think this need will be more closely attended to it's not just one way the moment we start um, making the options narrow is where human beings, I, I think, ideologically start to suffer. And so with, with physical touch, it becomes important, again, about the consent and about what touch kind of feels good and what touch feels welcomed. Um, and so that one, again, powerful because skin is our largest organ. And so when it's attended to in this particular way, be very powerful can activate what's called the hormone of oxytocin in the brain, which can literally send a, the message of safety to the rest of our bodies. Um, I don't know if, I, I'm trying to, it might've just been me and Sandrine on the call when this happened. And Sandrine, I don't know if you noticed it at all, but as soon as um, I got on the video, I did like this. I like gave myself this big hug. Physical touch is one notice. of my, yeah, it's okay. Some people, some people notice, some people don't, but I always think it's valuable to share. But like in that moment, I, I was like, all right, I'm getting ready to do this presentation. Like I'm getting ready to put myself before the people. Let me show myself this attention. Physical touch is one of my highest love languages. And so if not think the highest love language. And so I touched me, gathered me before I, anybody else needed to do it. So that's physical touch can go a long way for a lot of people. Any questions about the five love languages? And I really love this example. Some of you remember this slide from last time. I don't know, but I love this. Um, so it breaks down the five love languages in tacos. So where's the affirmation is, your tacos are delicious. Acts of service, I made you tacos. Receiving gifts, here's a taco. Quality time, let's go out for tacos together. Physical touch, let me hold you like a taco. I just love that. I think that's so funny. Right, hold you like a taco. That's kind of what I was doing earlier. Okay, here's where I would love and appreciate to hear your voices. Y'all yeah, have been kind of quiet today, which is all good. I don't mind speaking. Um, how do I most often express love and appreciation to others? 
I just want to do this inventory before we actually do the online version. I want to see what your thoughts are. What do you think? How do you often, how do you most often express love and appreciation to others? Could be your colleague, could be your romantic partner, could be your family. I'm going to go, I'm going to say acts of services. Mm. I'm always helping. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, what's the last act of service you did for someone? Oh my goodness. Babysat. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And was this for a colleague, for a family this member? This was for a friend, a good friend wow. was in a gym last yeah. evening. And, you know, we've been friends for years. I'm talking about going back to like preschool days. And he was in a bind and I said, no problem. And we often don't speak a lot. So uh -huh. it's one of those friendships where you don't, you know, it's not an every day I see you or every day we speak, yeah. but it's someone that I respect highly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so that respect, if you think about service, there has to be a value that's placed on the person, right? That willingness to give of your body and of your time like that. Like as, as soon as you said it, I was like, wow, that is to take care of someone's child like that. It was big. That, that's, <laughs> yeah. Like that is, that's a really valuable thing, especially how childcare can be these days, but it's, yeah, I, I immediately kind of made the assumption that it was somebody that held some respect or honor or value or appreciation that you had for that person in order to provide that act of service. And so Sandrine, would you say that's how you like that's how you would also like to receive that level of love? No. Is act of service? Nah. What would you say? I, I was appreciative of, to this day, I've, I'm still getting calls from him and his daughter to say, hi, auntie, like, yeah. you know, I miss you. Thank you so much. Like, it was mm. really a lot of thank you. And I don't want to, you know, I, I like a good thank you. I like a good, ah. you helped and, you know, when people oh, show yeah. and make you feel appreciated for what you've done. Absolutely. Yeah. Words of affirmation. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? How how do you most express love, appreciation, gratitude? Uh, hi. Um, hi. I'm a little confused as to which one I am, but okay. like we'll I don't find out in a minute. <laughs> food. I don't make food for people because I'm not good at cooking, but okay. I like like getting takeout for people or inviting mm. my friends out to dinner. Nice. <laughs> oh, I see. I see the inviting your friends out for dinner. Yeah, we'll we'll find out in just a minute which ones like. Okay. It, 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 here's the thing: like you have all of them. It's just usually one or two that's kind of like your primary. Mm -hmm. Um, but I get that it's like you're not gonna move it like at the act of servicing or like preparing the food doesn't align with you. That just like <laughs> not, not your thing, which is fine. But like you found a way to still show that love in, in the giving mm -hmm. of of the food. Hmm. I know that. And so I can see both the quality time and also tangible gifts in there as well. So we'll see. We'll see, we'll see okay. in a minute when we take the we take the screen. Would you would you say like that's if someone did that for you, how would you receive that? Uh I would think it was very thoughtful. I love oh. food. <laughs> We're here. We understand we understand each other. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else? And then we'll, does anybody, is anybody willing to answer, I, number, to answer number two? Oh, we got another person. Go for yeah, it. I was going to say, um, I express love through gift giving, mm. but it's not like traditional like gifts. I actually give them something I know that they would appreciate. Ah. I know that I understand them. Interesting. So there's some, there's some thoughtfulness behind the gift. I agree with, you. I agree with Perry. I can give you an example. Um, when I was yes, leaving please. my last job, uh -huh. <clears throat> I got my each of my teammates uh, a separate gift, but it was all on the same thing. So it was journals. And mm. one of my colleagues is very religious. So I got mm -hmm. her a woman's um, faith journal. Wow. And the others, I got one. She was just starting out her career. So wow. it was about step takings and motivation and then the other um got her stress reduction reduction a journal to help her 
and mindfulness because she's always high stressed. Wow. That's, I'm quite, imp- well, first of all, I was already impressed when you said you got the people journals and I was like, oh, the therapist heart is happy um, that you <laughs> would uh, give that type of gift. But then when you took it to the next level with that intentionality around honoring and respecting your colleagues' religious beliefs and attending to that, that, that says a lot about you. And I, it, it makes me wonder, because this is something I hear a lot about tangible gifts. How do you feel about receiving gifts? Carrie. Um, that's not, that's not the way I would receive love. I'm not, because I don't, I'm not a hoarder. So I prefer not people not to give me gifts because I don't want to throw something that they took time out. So I would tell Ah. someone, uh, something that would, if they want to give me something, I would say, give me like a card or something with mm. like positive uplifting or send me an email or something like that. Something coming from them. I'd rather hear words from them than actual gifts. Yeah, thank you for that. It's because something that I hear often and I hypothesize about is that people who, who their primary love language is to uh, the, the giving of tangible gifts to receiving. I've, I've heard that before to where it's like, I don't want, like you like to give a gift where it kind of takes up space in someone else's life, where it has this kind of tangible impact in their life, but to take on, to take on stuff can sometimes feel overwhelming. It can kind of feel as if like, it's going to kind of crowd your space a little bit, which like I have other hypotheses about that. And also like reminds me, I, I host a lot of, um, I host a lot of dinner parties and my gift is like, I cook all this stuff and I always feel a little bit cringy when people bring like food or bottle of wine or something. I'm like, oh, I don't have no room for this stuff. Stop bringing stuff to my house. Um, but I, so I, I empathize with you. I, I, I get that. Um, anybody willing to, I know I want us to do the, the, anybody willing to answer number two? What do I complain most often about? And you can say this can be with your job. This can be with your romantic relationships. It can be in your family. This can be about this experience of life. What do you find yourself complaining about the most often? I, I complain about not enough quality time. A lot of times with my husband. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but it's changing now, but uh, he's a, right. an author and he spent 37 years doing a biography on someone, wow. a, a bunch of books. So uh-huh. he, he, and I love it because I'd love to communicate about subject matter and what you're doing. Um, but he, he really, he had a lot of demands getting the, a number of books out. So yeah, I didn't yeah. really see heads and tails of him for a long time, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but we would always mm-hmm. carve it out, you know, we were just on the weekends or something, figure that out. So yeah. now I finish those projects, but yeah, I read a lot of times I say, well, you know, geez, you know, so that was challenging. Absolutely. I always understood it was okay. Yeah, no, I get it. I mean, you're, your complaint is valid because you value yeah. that that kind of direct, like same time, not you know doing something together. Ness, um, that it, it, that's a valuable experience. And so, if, if the other person is not available for you, can really feel that deficit. It's like they're they're there, but and he has to do it. He had to do it, but yet at the same token, yeah. I mean, we still have these great moments where he'd be talking about a dynamic within the character whatever it was and it was just really right up my so we would always have there's always you know so it was good but at the same token yeah i think quality yeah. time is what i always look for you know absolutely absolutely evergreen that feels a physical touch and that is earlier when i was in when i was uh explaining the slide how it's the most powerful and the most challenging like, yeah, because it has this immense amount of impact. I mean, it goes back to an early neurological place of like, if we are not touched, I am going to die. Right? <laughs> if we hear somebody needs to hold me or else like I'm going to drift off into the abyss of life. Yeah, it, it really goes back to a formative place. So thank you for sharing that. All right, let's move on to the, um, I want you all to have this. Okay, so let's see how much time we got. Okay. I put the link to the quiz in the chat. If you all, if if you're available, if I don't know what type of device people are on, but if you're available to answer that, it's a it's maybe like 20 questions or so. Um, try not to belabor it. 
right? Like, don't think too hard about it. Like, just this is more so about like just kind of in the moment, kind of getting a little experiential kind of awareness of like where we think our primary um, our primary love languages are. And what you'll see at the end is it explains all of them. And so I'm going to pull it up here. Are y'all able to open that link? Sweet. Yes. Oh, I wish I didn't plan this out. I should have like played a little music or something like that as you were doing the quiz. It's not too late. Modern technology. I'm trying to think of. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if y'all could hear it if I play it on my end though. <laughs> this is so funny. Oh, could you hear that when I played that? I'm not hearing it. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna work. The next time I do one of these presentations, I'm gonna put in a sound clip, even though I don't exactly know how to do that. I'm gonna figure it out. How's it coming? Everything going? Y'all still doing it? Yeah. Sweet. I was attempting to play Endless Love while y'all were doing this. I saw I'm like humming, I'm like humming it in my head. <laughs> you sing james you you could sing a little i, bit. I know i'm retired okay. i am <laughs> <laughs> my neighbors would not say the same we recently got a very nice karaoke machine for christmas it was a household gift to us and it is quite fabulous <laughs> yeah. they made the mistake of making wireless mic karaoke machines and so man we had a time for new year's eve mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> they should make singing or karaoke a love language it would definitely be my number one yeah i think so Some of these questions are really, they really make you think. I'm like, which one is more, me which one is more meaningful? I feel a little, feel a little ambivalent here. Y'all almost done? I'm almost at the end of mine. I think so. <laughs> I don't, every time I do these things, I'm always like, yeah, yeah you knew this. <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear people's results if they're surprised or... I'm done. We're done? Who's mm -hmm. that? 
Uh, Perry. Uh, Perry. Oh, awesome. You want to you want to uh, share if you feel comfortable. You want to share your results and your response to them. Um. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't have a problem. Hold on one second. Take your time. Um. <clears throat> so, uh, the results say quality time, thirty seven percent. Words wow. about thirty three percent. Physical touch seventeen percent. Acts of service thirteen percent. And receiving gifts zero percent. Ah. Mm. Yeah. I finished mine too. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Perry. Go ahead, Maya. Okay, so I got 26% for um quality time, 23% okay. for acts of service, 19% for words of affirmation, 19% for physical touch, and 13% for receiving gifts. Interesting. Another word receiving gifts at the bottom. Wow, thank you, Maya. Wow. Anybody else? Anybody else so willing to share? And also like Perry and Maya, like were you were you, what was your reaction to your results? Were you surprised? Did it make some sense? It made sense. It made sense to you? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Anyone yeah. else want to share the um, results? I'm a little bit of a, yeah, I'm not right where I think I always am. Yeah, about 33% on words of affirmation. Quality time is 30%. And then physical touch is 20. Receiving gifts is 13. Acts of service is three. I don't know. It's, it's, that's right on. And you know what? It's so interesting because, you know, I'll use my husband. He, I think we have the same kind of love language. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. so he's about the. Uh, 90% on words of affirmation. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? I have a question. Yes. So I noticed that they um have books. Do you know why they separated like um a singles version versus uh uh one for couples and one for men? Is it the way that we communicate love or is it just the just different phases that we are in like finding love? Or um, understand? I, I actually, I would, yeah, yes. All of, like, yes to all of that. Because when it comes to love and it, it was something, it kind of goes back to something I said at the very beginning about like how um, contextual and subjective the experience can be. And so, throughout the presentation like most of much of it was kind of organized for like in like the workplace or in a little bit more platonic relationships but it changes um when we are in romantic relationships um because earlier when i said like there are certain things we need and certain things we don't need and so when we're in relationships it's about getting a particular need met so your brain sees that person as more of an avenue for getting that need met versus when you don't have that romantic relationship, you tend to have a different worldview. And so you get needs met in other ways. So the test tries to make that distinction in order to, to get more of a context of what goes on in somebody's life. That makes sense. And also for there, there, there are, I, whenever I'm asked that, and I, I sprinkled it a little bit in there when I was talking about acts of service, um, the five love language, like Gary Chapman, his, his population of people was a very specific population, particularly uh, white straight couples. And so over time, there's been a little bit more um, uh, influence of like intersectionality. Um, I mean, in 1992, we did not have um, same sex or gay marriage. So like that is now kind of evolved now too. And so there's been a lot more context added to the process of love languages. So that division is kind of their attempt to try to widen that net that makes sense yes cool cool awesome a lot of did, did a lot of you like there was two people and nancy i think was receiving gifts at the lower for you too yeah yeah interesting yeah well, i like to get a gift but yeah i don't know maybe no I guess it was a little low. No, it's interesting. Mom was mom was the lowest too. Maya's was down there. Perry's was down there. I don't know. That's piqued my interest mm. um, about what makes receiving gifts um, 
Hello there. But let's move on. Unless anybody else wants to share, then we'll keep going. Because I know we've got about 10 minutes left. But I want to make sure people get heard. All right. We're good. Moving on. All right. So how do we recognize or learn someone else's love language? All right. Big question. Very simple answer. Ask. <laughs> I know that may seem simple, but like we'll get a little bit more specific. Um, so here's some ways that I suggest to you, as I suggested to other people, is that if you want to learn more, get curious. In what ways do you feel supported? What makes you feel valued? And so if you look at these questions, this could be both for platonic relationships, professional, familial, or romantic. Right. In what ways do you feel supported on this work assignment? In what ways do you feel supported or appreciated in our home, in our family? Um, how could I help you today? When you feel blank, how do you want me or how would you like me to respond? One of my like when I'm working with my couples and we're talking about how we kind of manage conflict. So conflict is really just a, a flood of emotion. And so when I'm so when you're feeling frustrated, how would you like for me to respond? When you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling tired, when you're feeling joyous, how would you like for me to respond? Or I noticed that you seemed frustrated today. How may I best support you? I noticed that you seemed sad today. Or Sandrine, like you listening to your friend's need and then responding, right? How can I best support you? Okay, you need help? I babysit. I'll do it. Right. But that took vulnerability on your friend's part to actually let you know that that need was there, which shows that they feel comfortable with you in order to say that. But it's basically if, if you want to understand, know and understand someone's love language, it really kind of hinges upon how vulnerable you are to make yourself get closer or get curious with them. So if you're feeling like your your relationships, whether it be platonic, professional, romantic, if you're feeling like they feel stale or empty or um unsatisfying or distant my my first suggestion to you as i would suggest to anybody is what are you doing to draw yourself closer to it because we can't be responsible for what the other person is doing it's like how are you willing to lean forward uh, one of my favorite authors her name is Brene brown she in one of her books she says always be the first one that's willing to be vulnerable right always always be that bigger person be willing to get curious what makes you feel loved by me thoughts questions i try to leave some time to answer people's specific questions i know we got seven minutes and i go to my next session but like anything any questions about particular love languages or how you manage it or how you learn it anything the floor is yours Okay. How do you deal when um, I have been told the thing that I most complain about is acts of services. Uh -huh. If someone has told me I cannot expect me from others. Ah. So the way I show up is the way other people may not show up. But I also want more acts of service. <laughs> Sandrine, thank you. when you mentioned earlier that that acts of service that you gave to that friend, the first thought that crossed my mind was, most people who have a higher like primary language of acts of service, we want that reciprocity. And I think it is one of the most challenging, challenging love languages because acts of service requires a little bit more investment because you actually have to, the person in some way has to know you. Meaning if, if let's say you're in a relationship and like, oh, someone did the dishes for you. But if you really love doing the dishes, it's not really going to feel like an act of service. It's going to feel like they took something away from you, right? And right. so when we are desiring to have some acts of service, I think going to one of these questions of like, how are you willing to support me, right? How available are you to show me love in this particular way? Right. Um, one one idea that, that I think about often is like there's there's a there's this narrative that floats out there that we teach people how to love us. Um, I'm still wrestling with it. I tend to go to the side of you get to learn what love somebody is available to give and decide if you want to sign on to it or not. That that usually is 
what I offer to people. Um, because if you get into teaching someone how to love you, you're on your way to experiencing a lot of resentment or you're going to develop a dependent. So if you think about what children do or what pets do, like my lovely cats that are still staring right here, because they know I'm going to like give them love, like they're like, I'm waiting for you to love me. I'm waiting for you to give me food. And so they're, yes, they're animals. So they're, they're contingent upon me. And so that happens in human relationships as well. When you give people instruction, you're going to wait to see how they pass the test. Think about it. And so I usually encourage people that if you're trying to get your love language to be spoken to, like in whatever relationship structure, professional, platonic, or romantic, it comes down to invoking the dialogue around like, hey, I'm, I realize that I need this in my life and I'm curious about your availability to do this thing. And however they answer it, that is when you get to make your choice about whether that person can actually attend to that they can speak your language. And if they can't, are you willing to diversify the language? Because if you saw in that test, it didn't say you just had one. You have a primary one. And so oftentimes, if your primary may not be attended to, but the other four are, your brain is fine. Your brain is fine. So if one avenue or one language can't be spoken, get bilingual. You feel me? Does that answer your question, Sandrine? It does. Thank you so much. I'm going to work welcome. on it. <laughs> it's hard. And often, because if, if you think it's called the five love languages, right? At the core of it, it's about love. So love is multifaceted. It can come in to our lives any sort of way if we're willing to receive it but again going back to that the statement of you get to watch how somebody is willing to love and then decide if you want to participate my uh my favorite example of it in this i don't even know why i use this example sometimes but have you ever watched someone do double dutch like the rope game and you know how they're usually waiting on the side to kind of decide if they want to jump in or not yeah and so the rope is someone's love, right? That's someone's life. And so you're kind of waiting to see if you're going to find entry to that jump point or not, right? And if you jump in and like it, you know, it, it whips the ankle, that's when you get to kind of have a conversation of like, ouch, I don't know if I want to be loved that way. But then when you eventually find your rhythm, you can jump. But until you actually jump in, you don't know if you're going to find that rhythm or not. You're just going to be on the sideline kind of waiting if you want to jump in. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense, actually. There's risk involved, but you'll always get information regardless of the outcome. Yes, I broke my foot double dutch in two years ago, so I'll never take that risk again. Yikes. Yikes, Maya. Thank, thank, that is... That is probably also why I've never attempted it because it always seemed a little fearful to me. But I loved watching people make the attempt. Yeah. Not for me. I don't want to be loved that way. <laughs> Any other questions? Let me check the chat real quick to make sure. I love these get curious questions too because I like yeah. to use them sometimes as a check-in because sometimes if you're really busy and you, you want to be connected with people but you're really out of touch, whatever, because you, you just work or whatever it is, um, just sometimes like having a, an opportunity to sit quietly and, and connect with somebody intentionally and even ask, doing a check-in, how are you doing these days? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Curiosity. Uh, is there anything, uh, is there anything you, you want to see a little differently or is mm -hmm. there any way, you know? And so, yeah, it opens up yep. another, it's, it's not exactly a double dutch and jump it in there, but it is a mm -hmm. little bit. It's kind of yeah, a, absolutely. a more intimate conversation to mm -hmm. grasp for a little more depth in the relationship as you're going along in life. Absolutely. All of us on this call, regardless of the love languages and what's primary, what's secondary, what's last on the list, every single human being wants to be attended to in a particular way that gives them information that they matter. That's all we want is to know, and we all have our different ways of learning or knowing if you touch me, I know that you see me because you're physically putting your hand on me. If you do this act of service, if you're talking to me, if you're looking at me in my eyes, it sends a message to the human brain that I hold enough value for this person to attend to me. 
That's what we want. Then it comes, are we making ourselves available to be attended to? All right. Well, I just want to thank you, James, for another uh, amazing session and just giving us so much information and insight. And I hope we can share the link that you sent us with our loved ones and teach yeah, them something yeah. new. We have Valentine's Day coming up. Mm-hmm. So I hope that you guys get to share your love languages and receive your love language from those you love. Thank you so much, James, for Absolutely. today's session. We appreciate you. and We thank you guys. Yeah, thank y'all for showing up, being seen yes. and being attended thank to. Thank you, James. Take good Always care enjoy yourself. your session. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Y'all take good care. I'll see y'all. Amen, James. Amen.